Hi, my name is Steve Lee. I'm the head of the School of Architecture and I've been a professor there since 1981 and I've been in architectural practice uh, for over 40 years now. Today's presentation I think is very timely. The title of it is, What Does It Take to Make Your Building Green? I find in my architectural career that a more typical question that I get asked is, why should we make our buildings green? I think it's time for a complete paradigm shift. As you see from this image representing suburban sprawl, we're taking our youngest children and convincing them that they need an automobile to get around to do the things in their daily life in a neighborhood that's solely homes. There are no businesses, there are no schools, there are no shops in that particular neighborhood. And most importantly, there are absolutely no sidewalks that someone could actually, if they chose to walk, would be able to walk. Let me give you a few statistics from the Environmental Protection Agency. We have almost 128 million residential units in the United States. We have almost 5 million square feet of office buildings in the United States. And buildings together account for 40% of the total energy consumption in the United States, as well as 40% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. In addition, buildings account for over 70% of the electricity that we use today. More importantly, from the human perspective, we spend over 90% of our time indoors. So the quality of a building that we occupy is extremely important to our health. Another big issue, as we see the drought that's been happening this summer, is the amount of water that we use. Buildings consume 13% of the total water used in the United States. In 50 years, the population in the United States has doubled but our water demand has tripled. Of the 26 million gallons of water that we use in the United States, about 30% is, of that is used for outdoor irrigation and landscaping. We spend $4 billion every year to keep our water clean and to run our wastewater utilities. Another big issue is the amount of impervious surfaces that we've introduced into the United States. If you look at the total area of impervious surfaces in the United States, it would cover an area 75% of the state of Ohio. We generate 250 million tons of municipal waste that works out to 4.6 pounds per person, plus we recycle about 1.5 pounds per person every day. And then the building industry itself in terms of building and renovating existing and new buildings produces 160 million tons of waste every year. So what does it take to make your building green? There are really three steps in my mind to do this. The first step is to make your building zero net energy. This means that the amount of energy generated on site is equal to the amount of energy that you consume from the grid, whether it's the electric grid or the natural gas grid. The second important step is zero carbon. This is difficult to attain. Uh, the amount of embodied energy and carbon that is produced in making and transporting the products to the building site need to be offset by the purchase of renewable energy credits so that you zero out the amount of carbon related to construction activities but then once you start operating the building, you have to account for the carbon that's produced by the operating of that building, uh, typically from fossil fuels. The third step is to make your building zero water. The most aggressive standard out there for achieving zero water is from the Living Building Challenge, where they state that 100% of the building's project water needs must be supplied by captured precipitation or other natural closed loop systems, and that you need to account for all of the downstream impacts of that water that's used on the site. So let's go through each of those energy, carbon, and water sequentially and talk about some strategies for you to make your building green. Here's a great image from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that describes the amount of energy generated 
That's on the left-hand side of the drawing and the amount of energy that is utilized by different category on the right-hand side of the drawing. If you look at the top two pink boxes, we use about 20% of the total energy for residential and commercial buildings. The bottom pink box represents transportation and that's about 30% of our annual energy use. So what that really means is that 50% of the energy consumed in the United States is directly related to the decisions we make about where we want to live and where we want to work. The gray bars that you see here are all waste energy. And it's important to note that of 60% of the energy that's put into this immense system, of <clears throat> it's important to note that 60% of the energy that's input into the system is actually rejected as uh, waste heat. So the first step in achieving zero net energy is to reduce energy consumption. In the next five slides, I'll show you some quick strategies. The first is with regard to where we decide to live and work. I believe it's important to work in mixed use, walkable places um, to have a high quality of life, but also reduce the amount of energy just based on the decision that we make with where we live. The second is to take advantage of the free energy that's available to us, in this case the sun and the air, and design buildings such that they respond to the movement of the sun and the direction of the wind. I'm using slides here from the new FIPS Center for Sustainable Landscapes to illustrate a uh, zero net building in all aspects of that. And in this image you see an example of selectively tinted glass that filters out heat but admits daylight. You see examples of light shelves to bounce light deep into the building but prevent that light from uh, producing glare along the perimeter where people are working. And a really novel idea, we actually have windows that open in this building so that you can naturally ventilate the building when the conditions are good. With regard to the actual construction involved, I can't overemphasize the importance of insulating your building. Here's an example from the renovation of my office done three years ago where we used a spray foam material to not only provide double the insulation required by the code, but to make a very, very tightly sealed building to prevent heat loss from air leakage. The next step is to utilize high efficiency equipment. This is an illustration of a product that was designed by a graduate from Carnegie Mellon School of Design called the Nest Thermostat. It's an intelligent thermostat that records your degree of satisfaction with the space and develops patterns and schedules of your usage of that building to set the thermostat to control at the most energy efficient position. But in addition, it's connected to the internet so you can log your energy performance as well as control the temperature in your house from your mobile device. There's a lot of energy efficient equipment out there for new lighting systems, compact fluorescents or LEDs, high efficiency heating systems, high efficiency cooling systems, energy recovery devices, and high efficiency appliances. It's difficult for a consumer to know exactly what to choose, but a really good starting place is the Energy Star program run by the Federal Department of Energy. They have great lists of um, products that meet the Energy Star qualification. So with these steps, orienting the building properly, taking advantage of natural conditioning, insulating an air ceiling, and using high efficiency equipment, we've brought the load on the building, the energy load on the building down to the lowest possible level. Then and only then can we think about um, incorporating renewables. In this image of the sun, the, all of these sources are in scale. The big yellow ball, of course, is the sun. The uh, round brown object at about 8 o'clock is the total amount of energy that's used in the United States, in the world, on an annual basis. And in this particular case, the amount of energy from the sun is 1,500 times as much as the total energy consumption on the planet. It's important that we begin tapping into this vital resource 
to move to the future so we can relieve ourselves of our addiction to fossil fuels. The image here, this is also from the Phipps CSL project. They've installed a massive photovoltaic array to uh, offset the electrical loads in the building to bring it down to meet that zero net energy definition that I described earlier. There's a important rule of thumb that if you spend one dollar on energy efficiency strategies within your building, it's roughly equivalent to ten dollars in purchasing for renewable energy. So it's critically important that everyone would first insulate and reduce the load in the building before investing in renewable energy. So that takes care of the energy strategies. The carbon strategies go hand in hand because so much of our energy use in the United States is derived from fossil fuels. So for every watt of energy um, produced by fossil fuels, we're pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I use this diagram to illustrate the complexity of our carbon system in the, in the world, on the planet, uh, with energy, carbon being absorbed and released from the oceans, carbon being sequestered deeply into the coldest areas of the ocean as well as deep within the ground. Um, the net result of looking at all of these balances that have existed in uh, the world for 11,000 years, um, we are now at a state where we're putting in nine gigatons of carbon above the ability of the Earth's capacity to absorb that carbon on an annual basis. So it's absolutely critical that we begin now addressing the issues of emissions. So if you've reduced the energy consumption of your building, if you put on photovoltaics or solar thermal, to uh, generate energy on site. That's the first and major step in achieving a zero carbon building. But remember that in our current electrical grid that one watt of electricity that's being read on your meter is actually the result of producing three watts of energy at the electrical plant based on the efficiency of the power plant and the efficiency of our distribution grid. So to achieve zero emissions for the building, you can't just equal the amount of energy in is equal to the amount of energy out. You actually have to multiply that by a factor of three times. So this becomes a big challenge for building owners. The third step is zero water. Again, I mentioned the living building challenge is the most aggressive standard that's out there. They require that 100% of the stormwater and used project water discharge must be managed on site to feed the project's internal water demands or released into adjacent ecological areas. So in this image from Phipps CSL, you can see the beautiful integration of the water collection cistern at the base of a heavily landscaped slope adjacent to the building. So between the lagoon that they've created here and the underground cistern that's out of the view of this particular image, they are managing 100% of their project water needs and 100% of the stormwater that falls onto the site. So <clears throat> to make a green building, focus on achieving the goal of zero energy, zero carbon, and zero water. Thank you.